Trusting God for breakthroughs in the season of dire straits. And um, so I want to talk to you about just recognizing the seasons of the Lord. The calendar of God recognizes seasons. God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. Let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And that, that Hebrew word season that is recognized there just in the beginning in Genesis chapter one, it's actually divine appointments. How many would like an appointment with God? All right. Uh, you know, just with the busyness of what happens in a church this size, uh, people are always making appointments. And, um, and just, just uh, today, somebody wanted an appointment and... Um, I said, when can we get together? I said, well, you know, you've missed your last two appointments. So, uh, <clears throat> depending on how important that actually is to you, I would show up the next time. So, I wonder if God says that about any of us. You missed your last appointment. Where were you? Uh, but the seasons that are talked about in Genesis 1 are divine appointments from God. Out of that came the festivals and um, the, the assemblies or conventions. But the whole idea of the festivals, assemblies, conventions is that God makes an appointment with his people and then he says, I want you to put everything aside and I want you to meet with me. And it's important. And of course, uh, people then, as people now, think that there are other things in their life and in their schedule that are more important than meeting with God. It's always been the case. But God uh, poured out his blessings on people who would keep the festivals. Did you know that God promised uh, in the Old Testament? He said, I will promise you that the enemy will never be allowed to attack you during a festival. When you drop everything and come to meet with me, I will promise that your fields and flocks and your family and your, uh, your all, all of that pertains to you, your farm and your ranch, everything, I'll, I'll protect it because it's important to come and meet with me. So uh, that's the concept of a season. And I want you to remember as we talk about the season of dire straits, I want you to remember that God always has a redemptive plan for a season. God always has a redemptive plan for a season. And so, as we talk about seasons, uh, you know, we're familiar with the season. Uh, a season, by definition, is a recurring period of time characterized by certain characteristics or conditions. It's like, for instance, when we think of summer, we don't think, I wonder if it's going to be, uh, if, if it's going to be uh, icy and, uh, you know, the, the uh, leaves will be falling. We know that some, what summer is characterized by. And so... Uh, seasons are just periods of time. They're recurring periods of time. It just happens once. It's not a season, but they're recurring periods of time that uh, happen uh, uh, annually or in some cases it could be uh, like, the, uh, like the Sabbath seasons. It, it could be uh, weekly. It could be a, a Sabbath of Sabbaths. It could be uh, 49 years, but... The recurring periods of time that's characterized by something. And so I want to talk to you about this concept of dire straits. What is the season of dire straits and what characterizes it? Now, of course, we go by the Gregorian calendar. There is a calendar of God, the Hebrew calendar, and the months are different and whatnot. Uh, but the season of dire straits is a three week period uh, between Tammuz 17th through the 9th of Av. We're right in the middle of it right now, just in case you wondered. It started a week ago, uh, yes, uh, tomorrow. And so, uh, I, uh, so it'll go through August 6th in 2023. Uh, and the golden calf is up there for a reason, because I want to talk to you about uh, what the season of dire straits means and how it impacts us. But to do that, let's look into the history of uh, God's people. Remember, the Israelites were slaves in Egypt, and uh, God raised up Moses. Moses came and told Pharaoh uh, that he was speaking for Jehovah. He said, let my people go. And uh, Pharaoh didn't want to do that. And 
There were the 10 plagues, which by the way, were consecutive judgments against the gods of Egypt uh, from the, the lowest uh, in the pantheon of gods up to the highest, which was the Pharaoh himself. And so the 10th plague uh, was a judgment of, of the, the next Pharaoh, which uh, was the, the son of the then reigning Pharaoh. So anyway, uh, God judged the gods of Egypt and he did it through Moses. And then Pharaoh got to a place that he said, please take these people out of here. So, sorry that we, uh, uh, sorry I didn't cooperate sooner but they, they gave them gold. They paid them to leave. They paid them the riches of Egypt. Here, you can have anything you want. Please get out of town. And so um, you see that the, the Exodus uh, began with the Passover. And remember that all of the redemptive purposes of God are contained in the three feasts of the Lord. They're feast seasons. They're recurring periods of time that are characterized by something. They're very, very important. And the feast of the Lord represent the entire redemptive uh, purpose, the scope and sequence of God's redemption. And it also represents the triune character of God in the Son, which is represented by Passover, the Holy Spirit that's represented by Pentecost, and the Father that is represented by the great feast, which is the Feast of Tabernacles. We'll touch on that. But anyway, uh, this is them. Now, remember, they've been slaves in Egypt for 400 years. Here comes this guy that none of them know, uh, and he says, um, God has uh, chosen you, and you're supposed to follow me, and we're going to march out of Egypt. We're not going to be slaves anymore, and we're going to the promised land, Beulah land, the beautiful land, a land flowing with milk and honey and uh, filled with the blessings of God. And so uh, they put the blood on the lentils. Uh, This is, remember, the 10th plague. If there's no blood then the oldest, uh, the firstborn male in that household will die that night because the, the death angel is, the grim reaper is coming by. So anyway, um, they're putting the blood uh, that represents, of course, the blood of Jesus Christ, our Passover lamb that was sacrificed for us. So that's where we start our story. And, um, and then they, they head out of uh, Egypt. They see all kinds of signs and wonders and miracles, this being one of the greatest where the Red Sea was opened up and they, they uh, it wasn't just the Red Sea opened up, which would have been enough, but the ground was somehow dry. <laughs> they passed over on dry ground. Uh, and then, of course, the, when the um, Egyptians tried to follow them, uh, they were drowned in the sea. The greatest army in the world at the time was drowned in the sea. Uh, then they came to the foot of Mount Sinai and uh, they entered into a covenant uh, with the Lord. And um, that is the giving of the Ten Commandments. And really, our, our story of the season of dire straits starts right here. They're at the foot of the mountain. Uh, Moses has gone up to get the, the uh, commandments that will be the basis of the covenant that the Israelites made with God. And he's up there longer than expected. So just hold that in mind. And let's take a look at these three feasts. The Feast of Passover is a feast of redemption. It's characterized by the Son of God. The the Feast of Pentecost is characterized by the Holy Spirit, and it represents empowerment. Everybody say empowerment. And the the last feast is the Feast of the Father. It represents our inheritance. Now, this season of dire straits is going to happen right here between the empowerment and between the inheritance, all right? And it's important for us to remember that. God empowers us. He promises us his power in all kinds of ways. And then there's a test before you move into the fulfillment of that promise. Everybody say, the greater the test, the greater the testimony. And God is a God who tests us. And so uh, they've already, again, had... um, uh, Pentecost, before that they had the Passover. Now they're looking forward uh, to the fulfillment of the promises of God and really they're looking forward to their inheritance in the promised land, right? That's what they're looking for. Uh, it would be hard for us to imagine, but they have been slaves and sons of slaves and grandkids of slaves for 400 years. They didn't have two dimes to rub together. And now God says, Uh, I'm going to take you in this land. Well, 
Think of it. You're a slave. You don't own anything. You don't even own a wheelbarrow. And, and how are we going to get into this land? And even when we get there, so what? We'll just be a whole clan of homeless people, right? God says, no. The, the people in the land have already built houses. I'll drive them out of their houses. You'll get to come in. They've already sown uh, seed in their fields. They already have vineyards. I am going to give you everything that they worked for. You, now, if you're a bad guy, you would say, that don't seem fair. But remember, God lays up the wealth of the wicked for the righteous. And so that's the deal. So, so here they are coming out of Egypt. They're going into this. They're all going to have uh, houses, big houses, because giants built them. <laughs> Uh, uh, vineyards, uh, uh, all kinds of stuff, and they're going to just be, be able to w waltz in and inherit their inheritance. So they go from a pauper to a prince overnight because God's with them. So that's the deal. That's what God called them to. Now, um, <clears throat> the, the month that precedes this test is called the month of Sivan. And uh, I, I wrote it, uh, that's not a misspelling. Our word month used to be spelled this way, month, because uh, it was the lunar calendar. It was the month of Av, the month of Tammuz. But anyway, the month of Sivan, they all have themes. And the, the, the month that they were coming out of was the, the theme was divine empowerment, provision, and blessing. Because that was the Feast of Pentecost. That's the Feast of Empowerment. You shall receive power after the Holy Spirit is upon you. And then they moved into the month of Tammuz, and that's where uh, our story really gets a little dicey here. Uh, the month of Tammuz, the theme is choosing our destiny. Now, that might seem odd to you because a lot of people think, oh, you don't get to choose your destiny but you absolutely do get to choose your destiny. There are a lot of factors that influence your destiny, but of eight billion people on the planet, only you can choose your destiny. And so God gives us all a chance to choose our destiny, and Tammuz is the month of choosing our destiny. Now, um, it's a time to win big or lose big depending on the choices we make in times of difficulty. Thank you, my friend. This is Milton. He is a faithful servant in the house of the Lord. Been an usher for years. He's an awesome guy. Thank you, Milton. Uh, anyway, time to win big or lose big, depending on the choices that we make. Now, this is really important for us uh, because this season thing is a real thing. It's a recurring set of circumstances, and, but we get to choose our way through that. So, how many w would prefer to win big? Okay, uh, you need to make hard right choices in the season of dire straits. Because if you make the easy wrong choices, the season that was meant to qualify you will disqualify you because of your bad choices and you'll lose big in times of difficulty. All right, so let's take a look at this. What happened between Savan and Tammuz that derailed the blessings of God in this, in this cycle uh, with the children of Israel? Remember, they were afforded an opportunity to covenant with God to be empowered to inherit the promised land. That was the big event. Uh, it's the big event for us. God says, I'll give you power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And the whole idea is that uh, empowered by God, will grow up into all things into Christ who is the head, uh, will inherit our great and precious promises, and be able to share the gospel and cast out demons and heal the sick and raise the dead, all those kind of things that are promises given to each one of us. And, and the Holy Spirit gives us empowerment, and then we are faced with a whole life of choices that either undermine that promise of empowerment or 
they facilitate that empowerment leading you into the blessing that God has designed and ordained for your life. It's a big deal. So you see a picture here of uh, what they estimate to be uh, uh, six million Israelites at the base of Mount Sinai. They set up their camp there and they, they came into covenant with God. Now, let's take a look at it out of the Bible. Uh, <clears throat> Moses said, you stay here. Uh, God is going to blow the shofar. Did you know that? God blew the first shofar, the first one ever recorded in history, was blown by God on the top of Mount uh, uh, Sinai. And he said, uh, God's going to blow the, the trump of redemption. And if anybody's on the mountain, they'll be instantly killed. If any animals are on the mountain, they'll be instantly killed. God Almighty is going to come down and blow the trumpet and I'm going to go up there and see what he has to say. The people says, you do that, we'll stay right here, right? And so that's what happened. Well, um, he was gone for a while. He was gone for 40 days. No food, no water. He just walked up there. The mountain would have still been smoking. The, uh, the fire of God came down on the mountain. And I don't know how long it took, but I'm thinking... In less than a week, people start saying, you think he made it? No, I don't think he made it. The mountain's still smoking. I, I think he was an idiot to go up there. God said if anybody was on the mountain, he'd kill him, and he just marched right up there. And two weeks gone by. Now, now it's going out through the whole community like, nah, he didn't make it. And, and there are people that are saying stupid things like, well, I, I think I would be a good leader. Listen, I've been around this kind of stuff my whole life. I know there were people saying, me, I would be really good. I honestly think I should have led the way all along. But anyway, there's all kinds of stuff happening in the ranks of God's people. And somewhere along the line, people begin to say, Moses didn't make it, which means the God he wanted to serve is not on our side. We need to come up with another God. That's scary. Now, Aaron said, take the gold rings from the ears of your wives and sons and daughters. I don't know why the sons were wearing them, but anyway. Uh, take the gold rings from the ears of your wives and sons and daughters. Bring them to me. All the people took the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron, proving that human nature hasn't changed much in the last 3,500 years. <laughs> and out of the earrings in the congregation, they had enough to make a whole... A uh, bullock of gold. So Aaron took the gold, melted it down, and molded it into the shape of a calf. Th that actually uh, is better translated an oxen because it, calf we think of a little thing. It was a big old uh, bullock. When the people saw it, they exclaimed, Oh, Israel, these are the gods who brought you out of the land of Egypt. How many think that Jehovah Almighty noticed them saying that? I, I can... I can imagine Moses talking to God, so just a minute. What? They attributed their salvation to a golden calf and idol. Uh, and so we've been talking about this with the last series that I did, uh, which was the ecstasy of loving God. But th this is the heart of sin throughout all ages. My people have done two things. They've abandoned me, the source of all good, the fount of living water. They've made their own cisterns that are broken and can hold no water. This is exactly what the Israelites did. They said, Moses is dead. Uh, the God that he served uh, isn't for us. And we have to come up with something on our own. And so they made that ridiculous golden calf. They fashioned an idol, Exodus 32 says, with a graven tool, a molten calf. They said, this is the God that brought us out of the land of Egypt. And uh, Aaron built an altar before it and declared a time of feasting and revelry. So the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to revel before their idol. So, uh, 
this is really um, where the season of dire straits began. Uh, this was the 16th of Tammuz. Uh, and Israel failed in their test in the desert. They chose idolatry and they released the curse of idolatry against them and their children. So uh, we'll talk more about this season, but I want you to know this is where their trouble started. They rejected God. Now, honestly, you'd think you'd give God more than 40 days. He had just destroyed the greatest army in the world and rescued you. He had just caused the the power brokers of the world at that time to lavish their wealth on you who came from 400 years of poverty and uh, of slavery. I mean, God had done some significant things. And in less than 40 days, they forgot about him and made their own idols. So Israel failed here, and this was the uh, beginning. It was Tammuz 17th. It's the beginning of the season of dire straits. Remember, dire straits has to do with win big or lose big choices that God allows you to make. I'm going to say it again. Dire straits has to do with win big or lose big choices that God allows you to make. And everyone in this room gets to make those choices. Now, what you don't get to do is decide the result of those choices. God furnishes the result. But you get to choose, are you going to believe God? Are you going to wait on God? They that wait on the Lord renew their strength. Uh, these, these people couldn't even wait 40 days on a God who had saved them, a God who had rescued them. Now, uh, let's go on and take a look at uh, these verses. Exodus 33, this was after the golden calf issue. Uh, God was angry with them. Moses broke the tablets, went back up for another 40 days, came down with new tablets. They waited on him that time. But anyway, um, uh, this was after that whole uh, situation had gone down. And now God, well, what happened in the meantime, God said, I don't think I'm going to travel with you because uh, the uh, unfaithfulness of these people bother me. And I might just destroy them all. And so he said, I think I'm just going to send my angel. Maybe he'll be a little bit more tolerant. But I'm not going to put up with this worship and golden calf stuff. And Moses said, if you don't go with us, I will not go either. You can kill me right where I stand. And so they had a little dialogue. And God said that, okay, I'll, I'll go with you. And so, it, but he said... He said, go up to the land I swore to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, th this is on the heels of God letting them know, I'm very unhappy with your disobedience. And so on the heels of that, he says, uh, go to the land that I told Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that I would give to them and to their descendants, which he was talking to at the time. And so as the story unfolds, uh, he says, I'll send an angel before you to drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. Now, Deuteronomy chapter seven, he tells them, you're going into a land and you will encounter nations, people groups that are greater and more powerful than you are. I won't drive them out. I'll empower you, say empower me, he said, I'll empower you to drive them out. But because I empower you, I promise that these mighty enemies will be utterly destroyed before you. That was a promise of God, okay? So he says, I'll send an angel to drive out the Canaanites, Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. These, by the way, are all giant groups. They're all, how many know what the Nephilim were? Okay? These are all Nephilim nations. There were other people on the earth at that time that were not Israelites. They were just people. But these were not just people. These were supernatural beings. We're going to talk about how supernatural they were 
um, because you might think you came into here with some real problems tonight. By the time we get through this, you're going to think, I probably have it easy compared to those people. All right? So he said, you're going to find them there, but you're supposed to go up into this land that flows with milk and honey, which are signs, of course, of the blessing of God. The Lord replied, listen, I'm making a covenant with you in the presence of all your people. I will perform miracles that have never been performed anywhere on all the earth or in any nation. That's an awesome promise. That's a can't wait to see it promise. And then he says, then all people around you will see the power of the Lord, the awesome power that I will display for you. But be careful to obey everything I command you today. Then I will go ahead of you and drive out the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the uh, Jebusites. Okay, so if we go on now from Exodus, the book of Leviticus is, uh, the whole book of Leviticus happens in one month. They're at the foot of the mountain, and God is just telling them, priests should do this. Uh, I, I want uh, you to understand that there are uh, five offerings and sacrifices, and there's an offering for willful sin, an offering for accidental sin, and blah, blah, blah. There's a whole lot. How many have ever read the book of Leviticus, right? How to deal with leprosy. By the way, every word in it is filled with meaning and significance uh, because it, it tells us how to deal with sin. It tells us uh, the, the different kinds of sin. It tells us all kinds of things that are very significant, but it all happens in 30 days at the uh, base of uh, Mount Sinai. So uh, then we go from Exodus, Leviticus happens, uh, and now we go into Exodus. Now in Numbers 13, um, they, God has told Moses to send spies into the land. And um, so let's pick it up in Numbers 13, 25. After exploring the land for 40 days, the men returned to Moses, Aaron, and the whole community of Israel at Kadesh in the wilderness of Paran. They reported to the whole community what they had seen and showed them the fruit they had taken from the land. <clears throat> Let me go back to that. Uh, don't know if I can do that anyway. Uh, so, I'll read it to you. This was their report to Moses. We entered into the land you sent us to explore. It is indeed a land that flows with milk and honey. It's a beautiful land. And here is the kind of fruit that it produces. And so they came back after God told them to go in and check it out. They came back with the fruit they came back with this report, which was exactly what God said. It's a beautiful land. It's a bountiful country. It's flowing with milk and honey. This is the evidence of the fruit it produces, all that kind of stuff. They were doing pretty good. How many think they were doing pretty good so far? All right? Until they reported on the giants. But the people living there are powerful. Their towns are large and fortified. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. Now, <laughs> to read it here, it sounds like they were surprised. God had just told them, by the way, you will find giants there. Right? God told them, it's a beautiful land flowing with milk and honey. I'm going to give you the fortified cities and the homes, and there will be giants there. They came back and said, oh, beautiful place flowing with milk and honey, uh, beautiful houses, but we saw giants there. Like, no kidding. Did you miss the memo? Right? Uh, we saw the sons of Anak. The men that went into the land said, we are not able to go up against this people for they are much stronger than we are. That's exactly what God had already told them. But he said, I will supernaturally empower you and uh, I will... Uh, caused them to be driven out before you. So they brought up an evil report of the land which they had spied out, saying, we saw giants in the land, Nephilim, the sons of Anak, and they devour the inhabitants of the land. In case you don't know what that means, they were cannibalistic. And so it goes on to say, we felt like grasshoppers compared to them. 
and they saw us as grasshoppers too. Now, I wonder how they got that part. I think they walked up to him and said, hey, up there, do I look like a grasshopper to you? <laughs> but anyway, uh, just so you don't think that you have much greater faith than they do, um, Og of Bashan was uh, between 12 and 18 feet tall. The early Canaanite giants were between 24 and 36 feet tall. And uh, that's a six-foot man over there on the far, far right. So don't be dissing on him for the natural response, like, I don't know if I can take this guy. <laughs> the reason I have that up there for you to look at is because God will bring you face-to-face -face with challenges that are intentionally designed to be too big for you. Remember God said, I'll do miracles that the whole world will wonder at. Well, that's not you being six foot and whooping up on some guy that's five two. That's when you're six foot and the giant is 36 feet and you kill him anyway. That's a testimony, right? And so uh, this is what they were faced with and, and they caved in. And it's easy to cave in. In fact, it's guaranteed to cave in if you do not put your faith in God. We are supposed to be people of faith. We are supposed to put our faith in him. And if we don't, something bad will happen. Now, all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried. All the people wept, wept all night. All the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. Now, these, these uh, 12 spies they sent in, it was the... The most courageous, most filled with valor warrior in each of the, the tribes. And so uh, they were serious warriors. But it, it doesn't matter how much you have going for you as a human being. You're gonna face things in life that you need divine intervention for. And that's what this season is all about. So, um, so, yeah, they were afraid of the giants, but Israel disobeyed God because of disbelief in his promise to them. He had plainly said, and by the way, they weren't taking it by blind faith. He, he, he already had changed the heart of Pharaoh, gave them the wealth of Egypt. He had already opened up the Red Sea and destroyed the greatest army in the world. He had already done all kinds of things. And so he said, this next chapter you're gonna be up against the Anakim. You're gonna be up against the Nephilim. But I will empower you to overcome them and they'll talk about it throughout the entire world. Yes, hallelujah. So, uh, but there were two good old boys, Joshua and Caleb. They saw the same giants. They weren't thinking, nah, it's nothing, 36 feet, Sha, I got this. They, their confidence was not in them. Their confidence was in God. And this is what they said. The, the other guy said, they're, they're as tall as the cedars and they eat people. These guys said, but if God is for us, they will be like bread for us to eat. Wow. Way to go, Joshua and Caleb. And so anyway, um, now what you need to know is that uh, the, the, the time of dire straits is the time between the failure at the golden calf and the failure in the promised land. Now Joshua and Caleb said, if Jehovah delights in us, then he'll give us this land that flows with milk and honey. Uh, don't rebel against Jehovah or fear the giants of the land, for they will be like bread for us to eat. Praise God for uh, the statement of faith in the, in, in the face of the giants. But remember this, uh, you have to have a giant to have giant faith. You don't get giant faith hoping that the mailman will bring the quart of milk by the time you wanna have breakfast. That's not a giant faith deal, right? Uh, you, 
have to have the threat of a giant to develop giant faith. And so that's what the season of dire straits is all about. Don't rebel against the Lord. Uh, Jehovah is with us, and these uh, giants will be like bread for us to eat. So Caleb and Joshua had more faith in the power of God than in the power of the giants. They never said, these giants are wimps. They said, yeah, they're, they're mighty. They're, they're awesome. They're intimidating. They're huge. They're cannibals. But God is greater. And that's what we have to hold on to. So what characterizes the season of dire straits? Uh, Tammuz 17th is when they made the golden calf. Of 9th is when they said, we can't go in there because the giants will kill us all. Now, that period on the Hebrew calendar, and remember, it's about the day of the month. It's not a, about the year. So it's only 21 days. More time than that had, had transpired. But, but those are the parentheses for what the Jews call the season of dire straits. From the 17th of Tammuz to the 9th of up. Now, why do they call it that? Because dire straits is like, you need to be careful during this time. God's given us promises, and we can, we can fritter them away, we can waste them, uh, we, we can disparage them, or we can hang on to them through hell and high water and get the promise fulfillment in our life. That's why it is so, so important. But uh, I'm gonna show you something that most of you will probably be uh, surprised at, all right? So... Um, <clears throat> This is the month of Tem... And if the, you ask a kosher Jew about the month of Tammuz, he'll say it's the month of choosing your destiny. Why? Because you can choose to build a golden calf and turn your back on God, or you can choose to wait on God. How many have found out that sometimes the things that you really want and pray for and fast for, you, you have to wait a while? Of course you do, right? That's where they fail. They probably were good for the first three days, right? Which is better than some of us. We, we pray, and if they haven't got an answer in 10 minutes, it's like, yeah, shocks, prayer doesn't work, right? But, but we choose to be inheritors of the promise or to forfeit the promise we choose by our actions. We have to have faith in God. We have to not have enough faith to do what he's asked us to do. And that will be against all odds, in the face of all odds. So, um, Tammuz uh, has to do with the decisions we make, and I call it the, the desert of our destiny, because our destiny is not made in good times. Our destiny is made in times where we are overwhelmed, in times where uh, there is supernatural opposition against us, in times where the enemy is roaring against us, in times where we think, where's God? We thought he'd show up in the showdown two weeks ago and he's not here yet. That's where your destiny is formed. That's when, when uh, you develop real faith in God. And by the way, the level of your faith can be determined by your faithfulness. That's why the two... Words are related. Faithfulness is remaining full of faith over the long haul. That's why people are faithful. They believe in the promise of God. I'm just gonna hang in here. I'm not going anywhere. I believe that Moses is gonna meet with God and come down and we're gonna live in covenant with God and inherit our promised land. I'm gonna hang in here. I'm gonna hang in here. I'm gonna hang in here. Faith produces faithfulness. And that's what determines our destiny, all right? So, um, the season of dire straits uh, is such a big deal in the mind of the Hebrews that today, if you ask a kosher Jew, uh, tell me about dire straits, he'll tell you this. If the wicked one attacks Israel, it will surely be in the season of dire straits. Now, I wanna just mention this to you. Making wrong choices you forfeit your destiny and the destiny of your children and their children and their children. Some of you are a product of that. Some of you, you, you never had a level playing field because your parents sold you out. Now again, we can still choose our destiny. We, we don't have to stay there. We can dig our way out of there. But, 
But uh, what happens is during this win big, lose big season, we win big for ourselves and for our family. Because it sets in motion generational curses or generational blessings. Now, Israel failed at the golden calf. Israel failed uh, at Kadesh Barnea. They failed to, to trust God for the promises. And, but, and they died in the wilderness. But did the curse stop there? No. Look at what happened during the season of dire straits. And tell me if you think this could possibly be coincidental. The, the first and the second destruction of the temple happened during the season of dire straits. The edict of expulsion, which was a big deal. All Jews were given 14 days to, to leave Spain or die. All of their possessions were taken off. Happened during the season of dire straits. Uh, that they, by the way, funded the trip to the New World because they ha had to leave anyway. But anyway, uh, we could go through all history, but uh, the Six Day War happened during the season of dire straits. Uh, it's a win big or lose big uh, situation that depends on the, cho the choices that we make. Now, um, so my question is, what destiny will you choose in your desert? Will be, you be like the fearful spies? Will you be like the Israelites? You know, th there were six million Israelites. There were, only, there were only 10 fearful spies. Six million of them had heard God say, I will go with you and I will deliver you from the giants. It, you know, it, it'd only take a small handful of people to say, oh, shut up already. We'll go in there, you know. We fire you as spies. You're, you're wussified, fearful spies. You're fired. We're gonna go into the problem. But they didn't. They lifted up their voice and wailed like, oh my God. What will we do? There are giants in the land. As if God hadn't already told them about that. But we can be like Joshua and Caleb. Now, I think it's beautiful that two guys just held their ground. And by the way, the days ahead, every one of us will have to hold our ground. Yes. Every one of us yes. will just have to hang in there and say, nope, not giving in. Yes. Not giving in to the, the globalist the Elites who think they're God, not, I'm not giving in on this, not giving in on that, not giving in on uh, the sexual perversion, not giving in. We just need to hold our ground. And Joshua and Caleb are the poster boys for that. And they just said, we're sticking with God. We're pushing all our chips to the middle of the table and we're counting on God, right? So uh, we all have a choice to make. And so... Um, <clears throat> remember, I, this is what I want you to remember. In, in both of these situations that are the parentheses for dire straits, the, uh, the creation of the golden calf, turning from Jehovah to idolatry, and the disbelief that caused them to lose their inheritance, both of those were tests that were meant by God to be doorways to great blessing. Please remember that. If you were on a test right now, I will guarantee you this because I know the character of God. The test that you are in is meant to be a doorway to great blessing. Remember, the greater the test, the greater the... God wants to give you a testimony. How would he do that? Give you a test. They're meant to be doorways to blessing, doorways to provision, uh, doorways to abundance. But if we fail to put our faith in God, then all of those things are forfeited. And um, <clears throat> so, the season of dire straits, remember, is a time to choose our destiny, and we're in it right now. I don't know, has anybody in this room 
in the last week uh, had some kind of a crisis or know somebody that's close to you that faced a crisis? Anybody? Would you look around you right now? It's like, you know, uh, Cheryl and I were talking. She said, man, all the hell is breaking loose. And, and I, I, it kind of snuck up on me. It was in my calendar. But I thought, you know what? I, I think we just entered the season of dire straits. Sure enough. It's just like hell turns up the heat. And, and God's okay with that. But his plan for it is always for good, not for evil, to give you a future filled with bright hope. That's the God that we serve. It's a time of choosing our destiny, a time that we win big or lose big, depending on the choice we make. And so I want us to pray tonight as we close. I want to pray uh, for, for God's grace during this season of dire straits, but we can call it the season of divine opportunity. We are in the season of divine opportunity. The, the Jews have dire straits, something bad's gonna happen. The Jews, by the way, are still living in unbelief. And so the curse of unbelief is still something that they deal with. But I want you to think about the, the gracious nature of your Father God. Remember, th this is the test that comes between the feast of divine empowerment and the feast of inheritance. God has empowered us. He's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. We can trust him in the situation we're in. And if we will trust him, the door of Achor, the door of trouble will become a gateway of hope. And uh, so, so I wanted to share this message because there's so much at stake. And I know what it's like to be overwhelmed and I know what it's like to be pretty darn whelmed for a long period of time. Not quite overwhelmed, but pretty darn whelmed, <laughs> just hanging on, you know. Uh, but, but God will help us and will strengthen us. And uh, we always have choices to make. And we need to make choices of faith in a miracle work in God. Now, um, I want to uh, just share these verses and then we're going to pray for one another. But in Deuteronomy 8.16, Deuteronomy is the book of remembrance. And it's looking back onto these things that we've been talking about. And Moses said, God tested you in the desert where he humbled you. And one of the great tests that we face is being humbled. Things happen. We try our best to, you know, salvage it and put it together and make it work. And it's like, man, I'm just getting my rear handed to me on a platter here. That's not a bad place to be, and I'll tell you why. God gives grace to the humble. So when you go through difficult situations and they humble you, you are wide open for a gift of divine grace, which is totally awesome in every way. So God tested you in the desert where he humbled you. His purpose What's it say? What's the purpose of the test? His purpose was to, his purpose was to bless you with his goodness after you passed the test. You, you think God was up there on Sinai saying, oh, good, they went into idolatry. I'll squash them. I'll make them all die in the wilderness. I was hoping they'd make a golden calf while we were up here. That's not God's purpose. God's purpose is to bless us. And he will do that after we pass the test. There's a bunch of people in this room tonight that are in the middle of a test. And so we had a guest all the way from India. I told you about this, um, but Stephanie Steele, one of our intercessors, in a staff meeting um, uh, a week ago Thursday in staff meeting, she said, I just feel really strong with it. I need to pray into this passage of scripture from 2 Samuel, about God being the master of breakthroughs. She prayed into it. We had a great staff time. Later that night, a guy came from India, and he shared the same thing. He said, there's seed time and harvest. 
you've planted a lot of seeds, but I really feel like the word of God for this church is that, that it's time for a breakthrough. It was a, a beautiful confirmation of the uh, prophetic message that God was sharing. And so it comes from this passage of scripture. It says the enemy came out against David. So if the enemy has come out against you, you just might be one of God's favorite kids. The enemy came out against David, the man after God's own heart. And when the enemy came out after David, David said, Shh, what should I do, Lord? The Lord said, fight against them and I'll deliver them into your hand. The exact same thing he told the Israelites. Did you fight against them? I'll deliver them into your hand. So David went to Baal Perizim and defeated the Philistines there. The Lord did it, David exclaimed. Isn't that cool? It says David defeated the Philistines, but David's testimony was the Lord did it. I, I know what would have happened to me without God. The Philistines, by the way, still had giants amongst them. But anyway, the Lord did it, David exclaimed. He burst through my enemies like a raging flood. Oh, I love that. And so it says that David named the place Baal Perizim, which means the local dialect, the Lord is the master of breakthroughs. Aren't you thankful for that? The Lord is the master of breakthroughs. And so I want to... I want to ask everybody to stand as we close tonight. And I, I know that, um, you know, I've, Cheryl and I have been pastoring for 40 years. And you talk about a pastorally intensive week. It has been, it has been intense. Uh, and so if I didn't even know about the season of dire straits, I'd think, what is up? Well, I know what's up. It's a season of testing. But... It's not testing just for the heck of it. It's certainly not testing to destroy you or to slow you down or to trip you up. It's testing because God wants you to pass the test and passing the test will qualify you for greater blessing and that is the heart of God for every one of us here tonight. God's a good God. He wants to bless us. He's giving us a chance to have a a big as God, Christ honoring testimony. But that big testimony will come out of a big test. And so, um, if something about this message touches you and you need this to happen, I, I love this picture that damn breaking, and here comes the water. Just think, just watch that for a minute and just think of whatever's standing in your way and the Spirit of God coming like that flood. What's going to stand against that? Nothing. Nothing. Nothing, nothing, nothing. You know, there's a, how many know what nothing can stop what's coming means? Uh, some of you more need to be on true social more. Nothing can stop what's coming. But anyway, uh, listen, uh, nothing can stop the hand of God. And if God's grace was sufficient for six-foot soldiers to overcome 36-foot supernaturally empowered cannibalistic giants, I think what you're facing is probably less significant than that. God's grace is sufficient to whatever you happen to be facing. And so if you are trusting God for a breakthrough, just come up here. Dwayne's going to lead us in a song. Uh, we're, we're going to pray. Uh, one thing I want to do tonight is to pray again for Dwayne and Juanita and Angie, who uh, is my niece, but we all love Angie. Angie uh, has had another brain surgery, emergency brain surgery. Angie needs a breakthrough. Um, and Dwayne and Juanita need a breakthrough. And how, how many how many just really need a breakthrough? You really need a breakthrough. Okay. So the good news is God is the master of breakthroughs. There's not one of our problems tonight that God's thinking, whoa, what could I do for her? Man, I don't know. You know, I'm tapping out on this guy. No. 
He's the master of breakthroughs. So, Duane, do you have an amazing song to sing? We did earlier, but yeah, I liked it. <laughs> Let's, I just want to sing and then we're going to pray and we're going to pray for one another. I trust in God, my Savior, He's the one who will never fail. He will never fail. I trust in God, He's my Savior, He's the one. Jesus, I just want you to uh, put your hand in the air specifically like you're reaching out to grab a breakthrough from God. Lord, you know every challenge that we face. You know the things that are deep and personal that we've cried out to, to know you and to find you. Lord, you know the, the problems in the marriages. You know the difficulties in the family. You know the, the physical situations that Lord, we can't heal ourselves. We need you to help us and to heal us. You know every need. You know the needs of uh, our personal needs, the needs of our families. You need know the needs of this church, Lord Jesus. We need a breakthrough in so many different ways. We need a breakthrough. And we call on you tonight, the master of breakthrough. We know that great testimonies come out of great tests. And so, Lord Jesus, we will stand in faith. We will not give up. We will not cave in because it's difficult. We will not cave in because it's taken too long. We will stand in faith. We'll stand strong in the evil day so that after we've done everything we know to do, we will still be standing when the evil day is over. That's our confession. We will still be standing when the evil day is over. We pray, oh God, for you to open up the windows of heaven over the church of glad tidings, over our homes, over our marriages, over our children, over our finances, over our physical health. Open up the windows of heaven, oh God, and provide, Lord Jesus. We pray for breakthroughs in Jesus' day. We pray that you would destroy the adversary on our behalf. We pray, oh God, for you to destroy the strategies of the devil against us, just as you promised, Lord. You promised that you would break through against David's enemies. Lord Jesus, you promised you would break through in the promised land and destroy the, the uh, armies of the giants, Lord Jesus. We thank you that you are sufficient to everything we need. And we call out to you, Jehovah Perizim, oh, Lord of breakthroughs, master of breakthroughs, give us breakthroughs in Jesus' name. 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 Give us breakthroughs. Break breakthrough against our enemies like waters bursting forth through a broken dam. Lord, wash away all the obstacles. Wash away all the hindrances. Wash away all the diseases. Wash away all the death. Wash away all the problems. 
Wash away every strategy of the wicked one against us. Come in great power, O oh God. Come, O oh God, and do exploits among us. Lord, we welcome you into our midst to fulfill your promise. You said, I will do uh, miracles that have never been seen before, miracles that get the attention of the world. Israel forfeited that promise. We say, we want it, oh God. We want it, oh God. Come and do miracles for us that go beyond anything we've imagined. Come and do miracles for us that get the attention of the world. Oh God, we pray that you will be for us the master of breakthroughs in Jesus' name.